out of the way. Written and performed by John Miro. 11. Mount Lago Complex, Mount Lago, Pasayton Wilderness, Oregon. Tuesday, April 9th, 12.10 p.m. Subterranean Level 4. Darius made a fist to let the lab tech take yet another vial of blood. Somehow, he managed not to take a swing at the guy, but this time it was close. The man could tell, too. His eyes kept darting from his work to Darius's face. Thank you, Major Webb, the tech said, breathing a relieved sigh that fogged his suit's faceplate as he backed away with the latest tray of vials. As soon as the tech passed through the airlock and out of earshot, the speaker in the ceiling clicked back on. Shall we continue, Major? Despite the politeness, the gravelly voice on the speaker was not asking. Yes, General. Darius sat up and threw his legs to the left, facing the long window on the wall and the line of suits and uniforms standing on the other side of it. Mount Lago Complex's commanding officer, General Fields, stood closest to the glass on the other side. He looked down from the window, six feet up on the medical examining room's wall, flanked by ODNI's deputy director for policy and capabilities, and by Darius's boss. Mount Lago Complex's chief medical officer, a woman named Haglin, and the fourth member of Darius's team, his second-in-command, Captain Ferris, were also in there, along with several other shadowy faces in business suits standing silently in the back. He picked up his after-action report from where he'd been interrupted by the lab tech and talked for another twenty minutes, describing in minute detail what General Fields was calling the incursion. General Fields stood with his hands clasped before him, his peaked cap wedged between the medals overwhelming his chest and his left arm. Beneath a nearly bald, close-shaven head, intelligent brown eyes looked down on Webb and listened. Webb kept his words clinical and his tone detached as he described the fog, the monsters, and the scientist with fire in her eyes. But he couldn't keep the heat out of his voice when he described the lightning that had vaporized Burke, Hayat, two civilians, and Lucan, the first of the base's new arrivals. After I came to, I ordered Dr. Morales to house our injured and the uh, new arrivals in an empty room across the hall. I organized the able-bodied to provide triage, then I got on the horn and checked in with Captain Ferris. Darius nodded to Ferris through the glass. He assured me the complex was secure and communicated with the general's office as to next steps. Next steps turned out to be quarantine and containment. Even with several seriously wounded people hanging on, Darius couldn't really complain about Dr. Haglin's decision to keep the level locked down until testing could be done. If it had been him up top getting the same report he'd given to Captain Ferris, he'd be worried about hallucinogenic gas leaks or chemical weapons. He'd been hoping for some aerosolized agent. He'd take hallucinations over horror movie monsters with tentacles and fangs any day. No luck, apparently. And we're sure there's no agent or infection at work, General Fields asked. Dr. Haglin shook her head. This base is a rusted pile of crap, but it still seals tight. To ensure containment for my work, ODNI installed filters and centers all over this wreck. Nothing bacterial or viral has shown up in testing. She jutted her chin through the window at Darius. I kept him isolated until I could rule out direct contact with our visitors. He and they have passed every test I have thrown at them so far. Our guests seem a healthy bunch. Same goes for your major down there. To ensure containment for my work? Darius screwed a tight lid on his curiosity, knowing by hard-fought experience it was need-to-know information. His natural curiosity had other things to be preoccupied with anyway. Staring at the doctor, he raised his hand like a kid in class. Dr. Haglin nodded at him like a professor in class. My subscription to Popular Mechanics expires next month. Gets cheaper when you buy years in advance. So you're saying... Dr. Haglin chuckled. I'm saying, unless you catch a bullet in your charming line of work, you've got decades of reading ahead of you. Most of the men in the room looked nervous. Several mouths opened to argue with Dr. Haglin, but thought better of it, or, Darius thought, more likely didn't want to look skittish in front of each other. Spooks. 
While the medtech had been slowly draining him of blood over the last few hours, he had sussed out that the observation room had its own air supply and private elevator to sublevel one and the surface, which meant the brass could come and go as they pleased. Darius wondered why Mount Lago had this level of containment. Something to do with Haglund's work, that much was clear now, but no doubt it fell under need-to-know information and the VIPs behind the glass would have already told him why Mount Lago had been specced for quarantine if they thought he had a need to know. On the other side of the window, General Fields considered Dr. Haglund's findings. You're saying Major Webb is... Haglund waved a hand dismissively in his direction. Healthy as a horse, he's fit for duty, and I have better places to be. The incursion had happened seven hours ago. Two of the base's MPs, wearing the green military version of the medical staff's hazmat suits, brought more food, water, and blankets down, and then guarded the emergency exits and the elevator, locking them down. The newcomers, exhausted and malnourished, were grateful and polite. More important to Darius, who felt badly outnumbered, they were peaceful and compliant. At least they were once Darius started translating for the MPs and joined them in passing out supplies. It took almost an hour after the dust settled before General Fields let Dr. Haglin and her staff suit up in breathers and hazmat suits to treat the victims, and another hour before anyone was permitted to leave sublevel 8. The speaker in the ceiling clicked again. One more time, Major? Deputy Director Brewster leaned closer to the window. The tall man's thick blond hair was ruffled, but his suit somehow looked pressed and fresh. The language thing. Darius shook his head and shrugged. I have no idea, sir. Major, the deputy director removed his glasses, fighting frustration. Your jacket lists a lot of skills, but foreign languages is not one of them. No, sir, Darius agreed, but I can understand these people just fine. The MPs didn't think twice about it when they couldn't understand the newcomers, but Webb could, assuming foreign languages was part of his skill set. They were not. He remembered the confusion on Hayat's face during the battle. His inability to understand what Webb had thought at the time was English. Hayat. Burke. Green lightning. He felt a lump growing in his throat and quickly turned his mind to more recent events. After he'd been escorted with the last of the newcomers up to sublevel six, he'd been sequestered in this private room and subjected to a litany of tests and questions, not the least of which had been... How do you suddenly speak a foreign language the U.S. government has never heard of? In the hours since the incursion, Dr. Haglund's staff had ruled out anything airborne, including nerve agents or any other persistent threat to the complex. On orders from above, Haglund had also put Darius through a battery of tests that apparently proved his brain wasn't broken or washed and pronounced him battered but fit for duty. This, despite being fascinated to discover he could speak every language she could. And it turned out Dr. Haglin knew a lot of languages. More concerning for the brass behind the window, Darius hadn't known it was in English he and Haglin had been speaking. He hadn't believed her when she told him he had followed conversation effortlessly and unawares through Urdu, Yiddish, and Vietnamese until she played him the lab surveillance video. Weirder still, the video clearly showing his recorded image making sounds he could not understand even as he watched them come out of his mouth. That creeped him out, almost as much as the tentacle monsters with teeth down on Sub-8. How do you explain it, Webb? Section Chief Arthur Kale exploded. His shoulders were bunched up, his face turning red. He pointed a finger through the window. How are you suddenly some genius polyglot who can understand a language even our most sophisticated translation programs can't crack? I don't know, sir, Webb finally snapped but I'm the same guy you've trusted for the last three years. Same guy I used, Kale snapped back. Not trusted. General Fields held up a hand. Gentlemen, he said calmly in his gravelly voice, we find ourselves in uncharted waters in more ways than one. Now's the time for cooler heads. The deputy director nodded and waved his hand at Kale in a simmer-down motion. The chief rubbed his neck and stormed to the back of the room whispering something to one of the unnamed suits. General, Darius asked in the lull between questions, Miss Katsuyama, Dr. Yoshida, Miss Katsuyama waded through a bloodbath, then saw her godmother die in front of her. She's in shock to say the least, Dr. Haglin answered before the general could. 
I'm giving the civilians and the new arrivals time to process and heal before I let this inquisition anywhere near them. The suits behind the glass grumbled, but Haglin glared around, and no one challenged her. Dr. Yoshida? Darius followed up. Deceased, confirmed Brewster, not unkindly. Dr. Haglin increased the strength of her glare, focusing it on him, but Brewster pressed her with a question before she could speak. What did we learn from the remains of the combatants? General Fields and the deputy director both looked to the doctor. She stuck her hands in the pockets of her white jacket and frowned. I'm a doctor, not a veterinarian, she finally answered. These things are unprecedented in modern research, and there's no sign of them in the fossil record either. The closest corollary is to cephalopods, octopus, with which they share a number of features. That's all I can tell you. Oh, and what's left of them is decomposing fast. You've frozen samples, asked one of the suits in the shadows at the back of the room. Could you please stop asking me that, Dr. Haglin growled over her shoulder. You're here on our dime, Doctor, Chief Kale began, but Dr. Haglin cut him off. For which you should be grateful. If I hadn't accepted extra space at the bottom of this dump and brought two doctors and two nurse-qualified researchers with me, you'd be explaining a much higher death count to the people who pull your chains. No one spoke for a moment. Darius fought the urge to smile. Not a good move during a debrief in a room with the half of Washington in it? The half of Washington who, as far as he could tell, wanted a fall guy when things they were responsible for went bad. Haglin, however, had no qualms about pushing her luck even further. General, why is this room full of politicians and secret agents, but no one from the CDC? We just discovered an entirely new order of species— we have an obligation to- I understand, Doctor, the general interrupted her gently, and I assure you we will open the circle just as soon as we can, but first we need to know what these creatures are, why they were chasing these people, and how they appeared in a secret government installation eight stories underground. And if they had help getting inside, Kale grumbled, returning to the deputy director's side and glaring down at Darius. Pulling himself to attention, he tried to keep the anger from his face. Three years ago, Kale had handpicked Webb to lead a four-man team on clandestine operations for ODNI under his authorization. In stark contrast to those previously successful missions, two of his team were now dead, and a cushy assignment protecting a bunch of physicists and computer nerds from their own shadows had become a top-level national security breach. Darius knew this was a career black eye for Kale, and the man had immediately gone into damage control mode when he arrived at Mount Lago Complex, and it was clear to Webb his boss wanted to hang the whole mess squarely on his shoulders. Darius gestured to his bare arms sticking out of a clean white t-shirt. Captain Ferris had dropped off a change of clothes from his quarters a few hours ago. As you can see, Chief, he ground out, I have nothing up my sleeves, Regretfully, at this time, I also cannot pull a rabbit out of my ass to save yours, sir. Silence fell in the observation room. General Fields fought a smile of his own off his face. Careful, son, he said, not unkindly. Yes, sir, Darius acknowledged. However, if there's nothing further at this time, sir, I'd like to get back to work. I've been cleared for duty, and I believe I'll be more useful translating for the newcomers than remaining here. You will be lucky if I don't, Chief Kale began, but Deputy Director laid a hand on his shoulder, cutting him off instantly. Let the man be, Arthur, Brewster said quietly. That's all for now, Major, Brewster told Darius, his lips quirking upward too. Yes, sir, Webb said, and walked to the airlock. Did he just dismiss himself? called someone from the speaker before it clicked off. A moment later, the airlock opened. The young serviceman stationed outside moved out of his way and saluted him. Webb stepped stiffly out, returned the salute automatically, and kept walking. You have been listening to Out of the Way, an urban fantasy portal adventure. Written and performed by John Miro. Opening theme, Gotham Licious. Closing theme, Urban Gauntlet by Kevin MacLeod. Learn more at Incompetech.com. For more information, visit ServingWorlds.com.